All right. It is by my watch. We are in the mountain time zone. It is 10 01 and, and we've still got people trickling in, but we've got a, an hour packed full of fun uh, discussion around em- adversary emulation. Uh, the goal of this webinar is to, is to educate uh, folks around adversary emulation. We've got some of the uh, the world's foremost experts in adversary emulation to uh, help help in, enlighten us on their expertise. And uh, we're really excited to, to have everybody here. So we will get started. People are still making their way in, but uh, just as a reminder, this is being recorded and will be available uh, on all your social media uh, channels uh, after the after the webinar. Um, so we're go, we'll go ahead and dive in. Welcome uh, again. And uh, my name is Dan DeKloss. I am the founder and CEO of PlexTrack. Uh, we are a uh, platform geared towards uh, helping automate workflows around anything in the proactive assessment capability, being able to automate reporting, automate uh, aspects of your penetration testing and red teaming and purple teaming exercises. Um, I have a background in cybersecurity. I was a pen tester for many years, also a uh, security director in CISO, uh, where we did uh, get an adversary emulation program started. So that's my experience with it, uh, as well as our platform really facilitates uh, those exercises uh, for our customers. But um, really excited to be sharing uh, the the seats uh, with you today with uh, Tim and Frank. So I will let them introduce themselves. Tim, take it away. All right. Thanks, Dan. Uh, I'm Tim Schultz. I'm the Adversary Emulation Lead here at Scythe, which is an adversary emulation platform. So uh, trying to sort of play off of what Dan mentioned and automate uh, some of the adversary emulation behaviors that I'm sure we'll sort of talk about here in a little bit. So been in the field for uh, a little while now and worked at a couple of different federally funded research and development centers such as MITRE. And uh, yeah, so now I've been uh, working at site now for pretty much most of 2021. So excited to be here. Frank? Yeah, and I'm Frank Duff. I'm the general manager for the attack evaluations program uh, run out of MITRE Ingenuity. Um, I've been at MITRE my my whole career um, since, since graduating, which is now nearing closer to 20 years than it is 15. And the last 10 of those have been in cybersecurity. Um, I started off doing a lot in terms of um, endpoint and detection research uh, back when everything was uh, keep the bad guys out. We started looking and doing some research on what it looks like within, and that's where attack kind of sprung out of. Um, and then more recently, we switched focus. Well, probably about six years ago, I started switching focus over towards the red side and doing adversary emulation and purple teaming and help really drive um, our thinking on how that worked to leading to the attack evaluation programs that we have today. Great. Well, we're like, can't thank you guys enough for joining us today. We're really excited about this discussion. I think it's a very important discussion. And I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of clarity that we can bring to the industry as, as this, uh, this model progresses for adversary emulation, purple teaming, those kinds of things. And so, um, so in terms of the agenda for today, you know, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll start, we'll dive right in and kind of discuss what is adversary emulation? Uh, what is that in respect to purple teaming? How to get started and what are some of the resources that teams would have available to them and, and when should they get started in, in these kinds of activities, uh, making the business case to the to management and leadership and, and knowing that everybody is restricted with a lot of issue, uh, you know, constraints like time and budget and talent and those kinds of things. So so when should they do these these things and how do we get how do we get going and and how can we move the needle forward and and starting this process as early as possible so these are all things that we'll discuss I will highlight that this is a very interactive uh, session today. We've got um, lots of great uh, resources available to you, but happy to ans- ask, please ask questions along the way uh, and we will answer them as we go. And then we, will, we also will have time at the end uh, for a Q&A session, but definitely want this to be interactive. Um, uh, definitely pick everyone's brains as much as you can and take advantage of this of this time as well. So with that, I'm going to just stop sharing. Um, you know the agenda, and uh, let's get let's get rocking. So so in you guys' in you guys' mind, what is adversary emulation? How does that compare to and, and what is purple teaming? And how how do those uh, you know correlate to each other? 
So sure, I'll I'll jump off mute first. Um, so so from from our perspective, um, the, the the key thing to adversary emulation, um, at least when when uh, we at Miter Miter Ingenuity kicked it off uh, so many years back, was trying to focus more on mimicking behaviors of specific threats. Right. So historically, Red Team had gone off with let's go and attack an environment and identify the flaws and the, the, the problems in the process and people, which is all great, but oftentimes it gets more theoretical in what they could do. And at the, the time and, and still today, organizations have such a hard time understanding how to defend against the known. So why are we bothering with the unknown? And so adversary emulation to us is the way of scoping down an engagement to something that you can definitively say, this is an actual threat. This is something that has been done. You need to be able to, to as some people would say, eat your vegetables and, 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 and be able to secure against these. And so adversary emulation is very much the scoping, in my opinion, is, is the scoping of a red team down to um, specific threats where you would mimic their behaviors um, so that you can um, accurately represent them. And then purple teaming, on the side to follow up. And I'm sure Tim's got some reaction to that. But from my perspective, purple teaming is just how to apply red teaming or adversary uh, emulation. It's, it's just taking the concept of emulation, but being able to now do it in a constructive way with the blue team. So rather than be a red versus blue, you're now bringing both teams together, or maybe in some cases they're the same people, but you bring them together and thinking about both it in terms of the adversary mindset and the defender's perspective so that it's much more um, collaborative and, and, and fruitful versus winners and losers. Yeah. So uh, Frank, you know, echo most of, of what he says, because that's, that's exactly right. I think to, to add a little bit to the history of why adversary emulation is worth having its own distinction is because as Frank mentioned, a lot of the red teaming activity, I mean, if, you, if you've met and worked with a lot of red teamers, they're, they're creative people. And so they're going to come up, they're going to do their own research. They are, you know, and the best red teams are going to get in one way or another, They whether it's time, effort, resources. And so all of those, that creativity is fantastic for testing whether an organization could potentially be breached by like anyone, maybe even like a state sponsored threat actor. However, when, when reporting that out and sort of the outputs of that is either, you know, for a while red team sort of hoarded whatever they did because it, it was sort of a secret because they didn't want to give things away and they didn't want it to be uh, the blue team or the defenders to essentially write extremely specific detections to then say, okay, we stopped the red team. And it was this adversarial relationship. And so as we moved forward in, in time here with moving towards data-driven approaches, and I know that's sort of a buzzword and every, everybody likes to talk about, okay, how are we data-driven and how is security testing data driven. And that is where adversary emulation really starts to shine. Because, you know, this is where give give credit to MITRE, especially for coming out with uh, MITRE attack and publishing and continuing to keep that updated. One of the big things about attack that is it provided that common framework for both defenders and uh, red teamers and testers to come together and to ha speak a common language. And so that like can't be understated is like communication is something that's always been a challenge in this area. And especially when you have red and blue teams have traditionally uh, potentially had either different org structures or, or different reporting structures that uh, misaligned incentives. And so having attack and having something that brings everyone together. And so the red team can say, here are the behaviors we tested against. And you now have defensive vendors that are also mapping what they do to attack. And so that's where I, I bring, I'll, I'll drive back to this data-driven approach where especially the nice thing about attack is the reference to real world threat actors that have done this specific behavior. That's something that, you know, I think Dan sort of touched on a little bit earlier too, is how difficult it is uh, to sometimes communicate these things at multiple levels, right? Throughout the last 10, 15 years. And so when you can point to a specific threat actor that's done 
this technique, then that adds a significant weight to your report. And so it's not just, oh, some red teamer figured out how to do this. It's here are threat actors that are actively targeting us and they are able, they're going to target us with this thing and we can't stop it. Uh, do you think that, do you think that organizations need to know if, if they're being targeted by certain threat actors in order to emulate those adversaries or what, how does that play into this whole, this, the whole notion of, you know, adversary emulation and when would I, you know, start those kinds of activities and should I, should I have a, a perspective of, Hey, it, I mean, what if I don't know I'm being targeted, so to speak and, and by whom? So I think it matters to some degree. Um, right. It's always good to know who your 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 likely threats are. Um, I think one of the important parts about adversary emulation is less about like emulating that specific actor as much as types of actors that would target you. So even when we do adversary emulation and we might pick like an APT29, you don't want to be overly focused on saying that now I'm defended against APT29 because they, they themselves will change, right? Your, your emulation is going to generally be a moment in time. So you don't want to get overly focused on doing really well against a threat. But at the same time, right, you don't want to be just going off the hypotheticals. So it's, it's necessary to ground it, but not overly focused. At least that's my, my, my perspective of the situation. Uh, so this is uh, all to add on to that. You are a target. Like three years ago, we, or even four years ago, like there was talk of, you know, here are these threat groups, here are their, uh, who is, here's who they are targeting. It was often this focus on, there was that, there was this massive gap in capability between threat actors. And so you had the state sponsored threat actors were the, the tip top. And if you got targeted by them, eh, there's not a whole lot you can do, but we're going to like try our best. And then you had sort of the crimeware groups and things like that as ransomware which is going to be, I think, a driver for some later parts of this conversation, everyone's data is valuable. Every business can be targeted. And so I think that's something where we've seen sort of the shift in the information security field where it was it was something that security has been nice to have. You know, we would all argue that it was something that's a requirement, but until there was a threat that is able to target anyone uh, sort of mercilessly, then that that has now brought a lot of other businesses that haven't had to focus on cyber threat actors because they haven't haven't had to worry about maybe their business uh, essentially either being locked up or in some sort of denial of service attack. Uh, that's all changed, and so I think that in the last two years especially is something that's come to the forefront, and and so from an adversary emulation perspective. You know, to tie into some of our later topics, though, the question is always where to start. I think the advantage of adversary emulation is it gives you a starting point. It gives you a narrowed scope, as Frank mentioned, uh, because that's always something when it comes to testing. Where do we start? There's so many things, like even an attack, right? Even in this framework, where do we begin? And so picking a few threat actors that you're going to, to start with, if you're starting from zero, I think it helps you sort of you know, uh, take a bite out of it instead of having to try and consume everything at once. The only other thing that I'd add to going, going off of what Tim said was I think that one of the other benefits for adversary emulation is also the, the measurable component, right? If you know which threat you're emulating and what you're doing to emulate said threat, you can now do repeated testing in your environment to, to get some measurable ideas of how you're improving against defending against that threat. Um, so again, it's it's a little bit of of a double edged sword. You don't want to overtune, but at the same time, you don't want to just joust windmills. So um, it, it's definitely uh, got its multifaceted uh, benefits, in my opinion. Yeah, no, I think that's a good point. I mean, I've always in I've I've been really excited about you know the attack framework, you know, because coming from a pen testing background knowing like, hey, you know, we tested a bunch of organizations that were compliant, you know, but we still got in every which way from Sunday, right? And 
Uh, and you know, how do we help these organizations actually know what they should be focused on? And so that's what I've enjoyed about you know utilizing something like the attack framework because it really breaks it down into like how is a how is a breach going to happen in your environment? And if at a minimum you have some techniques and tactics that you can start to measure against that you know exist in the world, right? Um, I think for in the early days, you know, you just, you just didn't know what what were these attackers doing, and now that we have this. You know this wealth of knowledge. You know to be able to compare against. At least we have a starting point there, and I think that's that's been something that's been good from a practitioner perspective. And we'll start to talk about like, well, when should we be able to detect these things and, and stuff like that. Um, uh, you know, and I think I think when we were when we were kind of prepping for this, you know, one thing that I think we wanted to highlight was. Uh, the non-conflation, uh, you know, the, the, the purple teaming is not the same, or I mean, like the purple teaming and adversary emulation are not the same, correct? Can, can maybe each of you in your own, in your own words, kind of highlight what the differences are, you know, and so that, you know, we, we are on a common ground in terms of the, the further discussion. Uh, I think, you know, I'll tie back to what Frank mentioned earlier, because I thought that was sort of a, a good, succinct way to separate it out where adversary emulation by itself is essentially the, the, the short and sweet version of how I normally describe it is it's a scoped red team, right? It's, it's scoped to a specific set of behaviors, activities, techniques in some way where uh, potentially the only scope that red teams had to abide by before was that they have a target company. You know, maybe some more than that, but that's that I think it cap captures the generalization. Uh, when it comes to purple teaming, I think it's an application of adversary emulation in combination with more teams that are active. You're bringing, you're engaging uh, the defensive team, the SOC, you're potentially bringing in other parts of management. It's a very involved process where adversary emulation in and of itself, uh, if, we, if we break purple teaming apart, it's normally broken into three like distinct teams is typically how we've seen it. It's red, blue, and cyber threat intelligence. And so when you're talking about the adversary emulation side of, side of that, it sort of really involves the cyber threat intel and the red team. And so the, when you move into purple teaming, you're adding more people, you're adding additional stakeholders, and you're changing the value proposition of, of what the overall exercise is meant to achieve. Yeah, and I think that I can't really add a whole lot there because um, I, I I agree wholeheartedly, partly because it's, it's Tim, Tim Tim agreed with me to begin. But uh, <laughs> I will say that the one of the the interesting things when when we started doing our purple team was um, it was really to to break down that wall between the red and blue, right? So we were coming in and we were trying to do this research and endpoint uh, detection, like how to find the adversary once they're in faster, because the median time was like. 220 days at the time when we started like eight years ago or however many years ago it was now um, back before attack. And so we were doing every other month red teams in our, our environment. Um, and we were trying to build out our defensive capabilities. Um, but what we were finding was there's this big disconnect because the blue team was going off and creating a bunch of stuff that they thought would be detections and then the red team would come in and maybe own the environment or maybe we would, the blue team would do okay and, and do some detections, but it was more uh, happenstance in, in many cases. And, and at the end of the day, we needed to, to evolve more rapidly. And so by bringing red team and blue team together in, in these environments, we were able to do much quicker and iterative improvements on our defenses and be more honed in on what we need to improve and how to improve rather than just going off in these things that we think would be useful or think would be unique in our environment and a good detection. And so it really helped kind of shorten the, the, the development life cycle, if you will, being able to actually create blue team defensive responses um, to the red team actions. I think that that was a big benefit to blue. I don't think that, or to purple teaming, I don't think that purple teaming is a replacement for red teaming, to be clear. I think that there's definitely value in red teaming. Um, but, um, for a lot of organizations that have small teams, they need people that can really understand both aspects, the red and the blue. And that's where purple really becomes uh, valuable. Yeah. I've, I've, oh, go ahead, Tim. Were you going to say something? Oh, I was just, uh, I'll let you go. I've got one other thing I want to add after. Uh, well, I mean, I just, you know, from my perspective, uh, the purple teaming concept is, is, 
is that bringing together the collaboration that's necessary in order to improve the posture. Because we're, we're all on the same mission, right? Whether we're an external red team or an internal red team, we're doing some kind of proactive assessment, being able to quickly iterate, like you mentioned, Frank, on, on what are the small wins that we can go fix now? And, and you know, we noticed it, a significant improvement, even just by starting small, but having that more collaborative nature and being able to truly understand from both perspectives. The red team gets a much deeper perspective of like how hard it is on the blue team to defend and that you can't just do every, you can't just do the stock recommendation every time, right? And every environment's gonna have a little bit different context. Uh, so having people recognize that I think has, has been extremely valuable. And then adversary emulation kind of narrows that scope to be able to say like, okay, well, let's, how are we doing against these specific techniques? So one thing I, I I want to point out here uh, that I think, you know, at least I've kept referencing and just realized is, you know, we, we talk about how things have changed and how uh, MITRE ATT&CK has changed things as well. But I want to really quick jump back to like before that and what are some of the drivers that even allowed these things to happen? Because when you, when you think about it now, you're like, oh, why didn't everybody just sit in the same room at, at the first place? And part of the reason was that there was no information available. Cyber threat intelligence as a like uh, field was was still like in its infancy a decade ago because or and and maybe that's a, a mischaracterization but it essentially it was behind closed doors. I mean I remember when you know FireEye released their uh, APT one report right? right and that was groundbreaking attribution to a nation on all of the hacking that people had heard about and read about, but there was no, there was no information out there. There wasn't these threat reports to go read from. And so it's the release of all of that out into sort of the public and information sharing being uh, sort of a key aspect of current cyber defense that has really built this ecosystem that's gotten us to the point where we can sit down and say, here's what this adversary does. And even if I'm not the one that personally collected that information, I can go and reference it. And so I just wanted to like throw that in as a backdrop for folks, because that is why things have changed and why like MITRE ATT&CK when it came out, basically referenced and categorized all of those things for you. And so uh, just so just so people, you know, it's it's easy to say things have changed. Sometimes it's tough to at least directly link to yeah, why. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and the benefit to that, right, is that like that's exactly where ATT&CK came from, right? It was that use case. Right. We, we needed a language to be able to communicate between our blue team and our red team and then to talk about progress to management. Um, and so like that language ended up just being attack. Right. And it moved from its Excel spreadsheet that we had internally to being something that was on a media wiki to whatever it is now. And, and so. Um, so, yeah, so I mean, that, that that's the exact use case for why it existed. It was to enable that communication. So I've been been really happy to be part of, of, of the, the process um, through through to get to that point. Yeah, I, I mean, just to tack on that and we'll, we'll move on, but because we got some questions and I'm going to put out a poll here. In fact, let me put this poll out so people can vote and I'm going to kind of wrap up a thought and then we've got a question here, but I just remember... Um, so I've launched this poll. Go ahead and vote. We're talking about like what, what adversaries are most important to you, kind of along the lines of the threat intelligence uh, conversation of like, how do you know what you should be looking at and what are the ones that are most important to you? Um, but I remember, you know, com coming from a government background in my early days, being relieved when APT1 came out because it was like, finally people are talking about what's actually going on in the world, right? <laughs> you know, and, you know, from the security perspective, like we knew, you knew, you knew these things were happening, but you really couldn't talk about it. You couldn't, you couldn't, you couldn't provide any attribution at all. Right. And, and at least, but at least you knew like, this is what, these are the kinds of things that are actually happening as opposed to, Oh, you know, we're, well, we're like working on PCI, you know, version one right, or whatever. And not that those are bad things. Like, I think compliance frameworks definitely serve their role. But when it comes to true breaches and what we were seeing, what we've continued to see over time, everything falls in line with that attack lifecycle. So um, hopefully everybody has had a chance to kind of see this vote. I'll, I'll leave it open as we answer. I'll, I'll throw this question over to um, 
to Tim and Frank, and then we'll co close the poll. But uh, how was the implementation of purple teaming? Was there any pushback? So if you had it in your environment, so I, I can also answer that question from our perspective too, but um, you know, what tricks are there to creating a purple team mindset as opposed to red versus blue? So I'll go, go first, I guess, on this one. Um, so largely speaking, I don't think that there's a whole lot of pushback, but that was also because the organization that we were doing it in at the time was very much focused on research and it was a small, close-knit team. So we could easily pull together the teams and just make that authoritative decision. Um, you, it does take a certain amount of breaking down the walls of old mindsets, um, right? It, there was very much, and I think that Largely, the security industry is moving in a more collaborative um, way, right? So people trying to work together to a unified um, goal. Um, but at the time, right, there was just that very much mentality of red has to keep everything close hold that Tim was talking about earlier, right? Like it's, it's all about CTI is important, how I do things. I want to be able to use that next time so that I can be win again next time, right? Versus a uh, no, let me open up everything I did so that you can defend me next time and I have to advance too. And so um, it, it, it does take a little bit of effort to at least break down some of the old mindsets. Um, but I do think that that purple team is becoming much more mainstream um, as well. So it's been, at least from my perspective, a lot more like I don't have to go off and explain what purple teaming is to everyone anymore, right? It, it, it's now much more of like just that mainstream thing. And it's like, oh yeah, we should be working together. That totally makes sense. So playing off of what Frank said, so agree with agree with pretty much all of it. Um, you know, I think the challenge with all things in security is the, like getting that buy-in as Frank mentioned, you have to, you have to, break down those old thoughts and uh, processes that people have sort of become attached to. And I think to me, whenever we are going in and trying to bring purple teaming in, you know, as Frank mentioned, and something that I, I think is, is sometimes taken for granted in the industry here is, oh, this is the latest buzzword. And so purple teaming has been accused of that. Uh, but at the same time, I mean, we can go back again. We can you can go and look at historical data with red teams. Red teams were not very common a decade ago. Like some people had it, even only like the you know a few select organizations. You know, red team sort of in and of itself comes from uh, basically red teaming in DoD, and so the military. Those were sort of the places that uh, that essentially could afford to have dedicated teams of people to do this. But now you look at, I mean, if we just look at like job searching and things like that, you can go type in uh, on whether it's on LinkedIn or Google or something like that, and you can search for red team jobs and they're all over the place. And so that's where having uh, a large amount of people that sort of buy into this and create this snowball effect that, that ends up building, that's going to be one way to sort of get buy-in for purple, purple teaming. But also, some of the challenges are not just Did I just lose Tim? Are you guys still there? Yeah, I lost Tim too. He's frozen. Uh oh. But but I will go with uh, I'll, I'll kind of piggyback on for for a sake while he catches up in his uh from his picture. Okay. Um, but but I do think that uh, to that point, right? I think that that selling management on um, offensive testing, whether it's red team, purple team, right? That that's oftentimes where the bigger challenge still is. And I think one of the points Tim was making was that that is becoming a little bit more mainstream, right? There's more people with the skill sets yeah. to do it. Um, there's more noted need to do it. Um, we need these technologies. We need to be able to validate the technologies. We need to validate our security posture, et cetera, et cetera. So I do think that there's, there's more awareness and, and adoption therefore. Um, but that being said, I think that, that we continue to need to evolve as a community with the tools that we use with the, the concepts that we share um, so that purple teaming doesn't continue to be an elite activity. Um, I think we've done a lot in that effort, especially over the last like one to two years. Um, but the bottom line is, is it still requires a lot of talent, right? Purple teaming, you now not just have to be aware of the red, you're now 
yes, you're learning about blue, but the more you do them, the more you're expected to know about the blue side. And so now you've got a bunch of people out there that have a lot of deep knowledge on both red and blue um, that's highly valuable, but it's still kind of centered around the elite forums. And so that's where I think that it's good that there's more and more tools that are available to do this in the automated ways and, and um, more communication, more open source tools, all these types of things that can help enable the masses. Um, but I do think that there's still some growing to do in both terms of people saying, yeah, let's purple team, let's devote budget to, to evaluating these things. Because the last thing I want to do as a defender is say that my stuff stinks and that I've wasted your money or it's not doing its job, right? I mean, that, that's a scary thing that's not gone away, even with the, uh, the advent of, of purple teaming. So, so we still have ways to go, but I do think it's, it's largely um, advanced. Yeah, and I think I think my experience has been that's that's why adversary emulation has been a great it push towards that because it is something distinct in a good way to start where you don't have to feel like, Oh, I don't know how to do a red team exercise. I don't know. How, I don't know how to break into an organization, but there are enough resources there today where it's like, well, I can at least go emulate five of these techniques. Right. And I can at least say like, you know, and I think we'll kind of shift the conversation into, I, I just wrapped up the poll. Um, I'll share the results. So definitely it looks like uh, Re Rebel or is, is, one of the, is one of the most concerning ones to folks, but this is a good distribution. And I think ransomware is obviously the topic of the day. Um, ransomware has been around for a long time, um, but, uh, you know, but definitely it's, it's coming, continuing to be in the news and, and people, uh, it's, it's much more immediate, right? And so, uh, you know, so like kind of shifting into the, into the ransomware discussion, like what, what are some, uh, you know, what are some ways, like how has ransomware affected the industry? I guess maybe like, let's start with like, like what impact has ransomware made from the security industry perspective uh, in, in your guys' opinions? And welcome back, Tim. Sorry, we lost you. <laughs> yeah, I was just like sitting there and then both your screens froze and I was like, uh oh. So, all right, I'm back. Uh, so, I'll tie back a little bit to what I mentioned earlier in that ransomware expanded who is a target. It made it so that it's no longer just these massive Fortune 500 organizations that have data that could be, you know, stealing the data, stealing the IP is, is something that is an easy business metric from, from that standpoint. And you had every other place that was like, we don't have any valuable information, especially after you know, essentially every credit card number on earth got stolen, you know, that, that information became less valuable. And then someone figured out that encrypting the data and essentially causing organizational wide denial of service, regardless of how big or small your organization is, means that you are willing to do uh, pretty much pay whatever you can to get that back. And then defenders were like, uh, you know, the first shift was shifting to how do we make sure that we have good backups, offline backups? You know, these are things that, you know, when we'll, we'll sort of talk about the cyber hygiene, none of these are, we'll say, like bleeding edge, like things that had never been heard before, like mitigations. And so these were all things security professionals have been talking about for years. And ransomware was, is now the use case for why you definitely need to have these things. But unfortunately, ransomware has shown, and, and this gets into, you know, an interesting discussion that I'd like to have with other people, you know, in a, a different webinar about how it's changed the proposition of research dollars to uh, capability conversion. Because this is something that's been really interesting is that We've seen in ransomware that they have been able to, to shift quite quickly uh, with new, tech, uh, new techniques, new capabilities, the ability to retool in months. And so everyone you know, that I've seen sort of talking about it, it like instantly equates if you know, the $5 million that, uh, they, that uh, Darkseid got from Colonial Pipeline, for instance, just to pick, pick a, a news story, they're like, oh, that's like, that's capability money. And what's funny is like, how many organizations on earth can you say that about? Like you, you put in money and automatic return on investment. Like that's, there's very few organizations at which we would say that 
there is that level of efficiency with money going in and, and coming out. And so that's something that I think that's sort of a, an interesting side note that I, I don't want to get too sidetracked on, but mostly just tying back to you know, the cyber hygiene that is the sort of unsexy part of, of information security that you, they're, they're abusing techniques that people have known about for years. It wasn't, you know, until 2021, really zero days getting people in. It was a password that was in a data dump or that was easily guessed. And so even if you have, you know, multi-factor authentication, if somebody accidentally clicks OK because they constantly get pop-ups throughout the day, if you're in an enterprise, a large enterprise environment, you know, that's how attackers are getting in. It's not super sophisticated things. And so I think that's where it's sort of, um, you know, refocus on the sort of bare minimum of what you need to have a secure enterprise. And it's sort of showcased that that has been very difficult to scale across the industry. So I'll share the mic now. Uh, go for it, Frank. <laughs> yeah, no, and I think uh, the, the, I have a slightly different perspective, right? I think that I don't disagree with anything Tim just said. I think from my, in addition to now you can attack anyone. And so it, it ransomware now, like everybody's got to worry about being attacked. I think that the other key component to that is everybody is now impacted directly from these events, right? Like when when my wife can't get an appointment at the hospital for a month because they're subject to an attack, right? That that's a big deal, right? And and so it's one of those things that um, it, it's now affecting everyone. So it's it's much more in the spotlight. And I think in some ways that is one of the the good things to come from this is that people are aware now, and and it's much more to the point. Granted. It, it's never good to be have your, your, your feet to the fire, um, so to speak, but, but it is good to be aware and recognize that we have to do things. And I think the other thing that it's pointed out is we've, as an industry, developed tools and sold tools and put all this stuff out there to defend ourselves. People are buying the tools. It's not like they're not doing anything. The tools aren't doing what they need to do or aren't doing what they do well enough, or they're developing alerts that people aren't able to process. And so our processes are broken, our, our configurations are broken, our tools are broken. And so it, it's highlighted that a lot of those, those things exist, right? You can't just buy the latest EDR, deploy it on your network and expect that you're gonna be secure. Um, and, and I think that that's another one of those things that's come from, from ransomware is being able to, to really highlight that problem, which then again goes back to bring this full circle of, why we need adversary emulation. It's right, because you need to model these behaviors because these are the behaviors that are gonna exist. Adversaries yeah. aren't gonna change their behavior. So you need to have good emulation um, and you need to be able to rigorously test your environments to make sure that those configurations work and then vary the adversaries that you're emulating. So you get procedural variations so that you can ensure that you're as resilient as possible and you can, get, you can go down and down and down this rabbit hole. But like, first you have to acknowledge a problem. And there has been no bigger acknowledgement of the problem than 2021's cyber attacks and, and late 2020 cyber attacks and executive orders coming out of Wazoo to highlight these problems uh, because they are. And so now we know that there's a problem. First step is acknowledging it. Now we can hopefully start trying to figure out how can we as an industry better um, advance our protection mechanisms and, and, and defensive mechanisms. Yeah, and I think I think what's I'll quote you know my my architect and my the guy that worked for me at our at our last job, um, but uh, you know he said ransomware is like the best worst thing to happen to security, right? Because it emulates everything about the APTs one through thirty or whatever, right? You know, I mean it, it does a lot of the same techniques that a, at a, a breach would you know incur. Uh, but it's much more immediate, right? And it's much more visible to the people that it impacts the most. And, you know, and it's like you said, Frank, everyone is now a target, right? You know, you might, you might've felt like, oh, we can fly under the radar because we're not really out there. We're not really, you know, but anybody can click on a link, right? And anybody can download something that's going to encrypt their disk, right? Um, so, you know, what it's, I think what it's highlighted too is, is, is what we've all alluded to is that security is largely, I, I, will, I will posit, 90% process, right? Um, you know, you, the hygiene aspects, which are not, <laughs> they're not easy and they're not fun, but, but those daily diligent things that you should be doing, 
you know, it, it, these these come to the forefront when you're when you're simulating these types of activities. And um, so, I, I mean, I, I you know, I just kind of wanted to opine a little bit on that. I'm going to launch another poll related to ransomware while we kind of continue the conversation. But um, um, you know, we've got we've got about 20 minutes left, and I want to definitely highlight what are some ways you know how how do how do companies you know get into, into this aspect of adversary emulation, ransomware emulation, purple teaming. How does, how do one get started? When do you think, when do people feel like they should be able to get started and what are some of the techniques and then resources available to them today? <laughs> go for it. <Tim. laughs> Who's going on mute? <laughs> no, no. I'll, I'll let you go first, Frank. I think uh, right. I think so, I can I can play off of yours better than vice versa. So. Okay, there you go. Um, all right. So, um, from from my standpoint, I think I, I've had an awakening over the last year, year and and, and change uh, to recognize that it's easy to say go do something and very hard for practitioners to be able to do it. Right. Like I used to think that oh well, I created a bunch of analytics to model attack behaviors, everybody should be doing this. Um, that, that's, that's a lot easier said than done um, for a lot of organizations. And so the last thing I wanna do is say, everybody needs to go and implement a purple team um, to, to do it. That being said, um, I, I would say that, that in some ways, lightweight purple teaming, I'll call it, is actually probably easier to start than a lot of sophisticated red team programs at, at, in, in yesteryear. Um, so there's no reason why if you have one or two defenders in your organization, right, they should be testing out the things that they're doing to develop or that when they develop tools, they need to be doing a certain amount of unit tests and, and be able to know that what they're doing, what they're deploying, um, the research that they're doing, the money that they're spending in improving defenses is doing something good. And so there's a lot of tools that are out there for people to put their toes in and get, get their feet wet um, with, with, um, um, assessing, right. So think about like things like the atomic red team, right. That's, that's a tool set that's available that people can just pull off the shelf and, and it's not that full fed fledge adversarying, uh, emulation, which might be a little bit bigger to start, but there's still things there that are improving. Uh, but there's a lot you can do now, um, to kind of start with the purple team mindset and it gets the organization thinking in, not just the what I'm doing to defend against the hypothetical threat, but this is why I'm doing it. And this is how it's working and making me improve and, or this is what it's not doing. So I need to change my investments, right? And, and so that, that's an immensely important thing, even if you're a small organization um, with only a few people that are, are actually in, in your, your defense. Um, so, so I think that that's the one thing in adversary emulation I just touched on a little bit, but I do think it's, it's a little bit more of, of, a, of a pickup um, if, especially if you're creating the emulation, but again, there's tools that allow you to really get your feet wet to be able to say, all right, I don't need to be part of the CTI to define what APT29 is. This tool's got an APT29 profile. Let me go and emulate that. And again, there's a spectrum of how much emulation is simulation or simulation is emulation and all that type of hot topic. <laughs> um, but so, so the degree of mimicking, if you will, um, but at the end of the day, right, there's a lot you can do today. And, and I think that that's the important thing to recognize is you don't have to be super, super sophisticated to do a lot of these concepts. You just need people that are going to want to do them and put it into their mindset early on. Mm -hmm. All right. This is, this is where I'll, I'll put my hot take. Um, I think you should start with purple teaming. Like, uh, and, and this is why. So I'll go, go back to, you know, my, my philosophical, why do we have defenders, right? We have defenders to defend the organization because there are bad cyber threat actors out there that are trying to compromise your organization. Now, you may have business reasons to prioritize your blue team, your defensive folks, whether it's compliance, auditing, things like that, that do take a priority when you're getting set up. But overall, uh, your SOC, your cyber defense is in charge and of defending your network. And so in order to do that, there's always the question, who are you defending against? Threat modeling is something that is, is often underappreciated, I think, uh, and is something that I think is super critical. And, and I think for a little while, people were able to 
use it if for no other reason than to say that they didn't consider APTs a threat to their organization, so they weren't trying to defend against that. Uh, but I think overall, un- that is like a, such a key component to trying to determine a uh, strategic uh, sort of vision for your cyber defense. And for that, you need to say, who is targeting us? You need to go through all the steps that you would essentially already need to do for adversary emulation. And so that's where, especially you don't need to have a red team as, as Frank mentioned, you can start with purple teaming. It doesn't need to be a, uh, a, a huge, you know, 20 person process. It can be two people. It can be three people. It can be one person. If you are the single person, in your organization defending everything, you have the ability to have major impact with that. And so this is where, you know, as far as like resources and things like that, I don't know if we want to get into this here, Dan, or, or also tackle it a little bit, but I'll, I'll highlight that, you know, not a sales pitch, but uh, so we have the Purple Team Exercise Framework. Uh, we've released it, it's free. And that is when I'm doing Purple Team assessments, I follow that to the letter. Uh, and so it, it's not just a, a methodology, so to speak. It defines roles, like who, what are the different roles you need? What are their, the expectations of the person that's filling that role? And so it's meant to help you operationalize purple teaming because that's always the question with these things. It's like, oh, I really appreciate this philosophy and things like that, but like, how do I use it? You know, that was a question we got often at MITRE with how do you operationalize it? attack right and i think uh that's mm-hmm. something that i'm sure frank can say whether he still gets questions about and, and so that's what i think purple teaming allows you to do is to essentially figure out you have all of these detections potentially or your tool that you your whether it's edr whether it's email defense something like that you can purple team any of those in order to figure out is the assumption of what you think it's supposed to do what it's actually doing and then if not, are there some tuning that you need? Is it a different tool that you're going to need? And so those are the types of questions that I think are really important for defenders to understand. And I think that's that's why, you know, like I said, I will say start with purple teaming and and move from there because red teams are not obsolete. They're just for organizations that I think have matured to a point that they need some like blind tests essentially. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I I couldn't agree more. I think, I mean, my uh, experience is kind of coming back to that being disciplined about what you mentioned in the (laughs) operationalizing the activity, right? Um, It should not be an approach of like, oh, we should try this out and then just go do it once and then not do like not have a disciplined plan in place, right? And I think I think where I've noticed a lot of security teams getting hung around the axle is like, they'll spend half their day diving into like configuring a tool or, you know, doing something and and not recognizing how much their time is worth and where their activity should be focused. So when it comes to purple teaming, it's in, and as in even adversary emulation, I mean, it's, it, it helps you stay focused on these are the things that people are actually going to do to attack us. And if we can't detect these, then why bother with doing all that other stuff? Right. And so putting a plan in place of like, we're going to do this once a month, right. Internally. And even if it's not like this fully scoped thing, uh, this is what we did when in my, in my previous position, we, we said, Hey, we're going to focus on like lateral movement. Right. And let, let's, let's pick the things that are in our gut. We feel are where some of our biggest weaknesses are, you know, you kind of know your environment, right. You know, what protections you already have in place and then just start doing those. Right. And then have the red and the blue team. And we didn't even have a red team, right. It was just people that were interested in it. They went and did a little bit of research, you know, executed this in a lab environment and that's how we got started. And so I, but, but what was important was we're making it, we're actually dedicating time to do this on a periodic basis. And it's not ad hoc. It's not um, when we get to it, right. It's a disciplined approach. And I think that if there's one thing that I would get on a soapbox about, or my hot take is be disciplined in your processes, right? I mean, nobody likes to hear that, <laughs> but, but it's so vital because your time can be very, very much wasted and, and not get the value out of, out of these types of exercises. I'm going to end the poll real fast so that everybody can kind of get a perspective of, 
where people are putting their efforts in terms of trying to prevent uh, ransomware or protect themselves from ransomware. I think this is uh, this is good. This is kind of what I expected um, to see. I would say that tabletop exercises are another good approach that that we've experienced uh, in, in in terms of people getting started. Um, what are you guys' thoughts? You know, kind of like based on the poll results here. So I think Go from my, my perspective, um, right? I, I, I it, it, it's good to see that people have are, aren't just relying on that that incident response plans and the backups and all that stuff, and that they're trying to look a little bit broader. Um, so I think that there's there are a lot of different aspects, and it's not like you pick one, right? At the end of the day, you need all these things. You need the 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 wall to keep people out, but you also need to be able to see within to know. What are the behaviors so that if that first line of defense fails, you've got another five set in place, right? And then if all that fails, you know, because uh, 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 the next solar winds comes out and you're just like screwed because it's so far upstream, then you know what, you're, you're still protected, right? Like, so I think um, it, it's good to see that people are, are for right there. There's a lot more than adding to a hundred there. So I assume it was multi-select. Um, yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> so it seemed like most people were doing more than one thing, which I think is a, a very good thing. And it's going to be necessary, right? Because at the end of the day, if you're just relying on stopping them from getting in that that's got years of proven track record of being a failing strategy. And if you're just going to focus on throwing your hands in the air, then why even be in the business? So um, I think that it's good that, that people are looking at that full spectrum. So, yeah, I, I, I think I overall think I'll mostly agree with uh, with Frank of in, in that. I think the key things that most of the time we try and emphasize is, is testing the people, processes and technology because so many people get caught up in that technology aspect is, is this technology doing what I'm supposed to be doing? And, and that's where it even leaves out the instant response portion, right? Because that is a process. What, what are people going to do when something happens? Because it's not if something happens, it's when something happens. Because solar winds, as, as Frank mentioned, I think is a great example of where, you know, that's where everyone is performing incident response because you have to try and understand exactly what happened. How did this impact you and your organization? And determining whether you were a target versus someone else is not something you can afford to wait for six weeks or more, right? For uh, new reports to come out. And so I think, yeah, overall, just making sure that you've got a sort of multi pronged approach is, is sort of the best thing because uh, there's a chance that something's going to fail. And so you need to make sure that you are at least prepared for that to happen, whether in technology, whether in process, or whether it's, you know, somebody's on vacation and you have, uh, you know, a, a team team lead that's that's designated as a backup. So I'll uh, I'll stick with Frank and uh, and go with that. Yeah, yeah. No, and I think I think you brought up an interesting point too in terms of you know the the backups themselves, where now people you know the ransomware can not only get into the backups, but but also exfiltrate the data in an encrypted format. So you know you're now kind of being held extorted with the data as well. You know, so I think that that's you know why you want a holistic approach to how you protect against these against these attacks. Um, we've got a slew of questions. I do want to at least leave a couple minutes for, you know, helping people get started. And then we can try to try to answer maybe one or two of these questions. I'm sorry that we're not going to get to all of them because I, I, I anticipated we were going to run out of time because this is a fun topic and, and a good topic that we're all passionate about. But, um, uh, you know, I would say, you know, that from, from my experience, the tools and resources that are out there, obviously Tim mentioned the Scythe emulation library, or maybe he didn't mention the emulation library, but they have their own emulation library of, of actors that you can download and, and you know, assess uh, yourself. Uh, MITRE has the emulation library as well, their own emulation plans that you can download uh, and, and run through those exercises. Uh, Atomic Red Team was also mentioned. That is a free resource that has the different ex uh, execution steps and procedures that you can execute in, for different actors. Um, lots of other free resources out there to help you get an idea of what to do in your environment. 
the only plug that I'll make for PlexTrack is that we do support importing from both of those <laughs> libraries into our Runbooks module, where it gives you that 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 perspective of being able to execute things on the red team, being able to defend against their, you know, communicate what you're doing on the blue team and get that data driven approach, right? Like you mentioned before. So that's the only plug I'll make for PlexTrack, but, but there's lots of other free resources out there. And, uh, you know, I think what's most important, like I mentioned before, and then I'll let you guys kind of, um, opine on anything else before we get into some of these questions, but, um, yeah, you know, is is having just even if even if you start with a spreadsheet, that's something, right? So, um, I'll let you guys kind of opine on any other any other war stories or things that that have you found valuable in the industry. So, I think um, that there's a wealth of them, right? Because of the way that the industry has taken a much more open approach to security in recent years. Um, so, I think that there are our, our multitude, right? The fact that there's an entire SANS conference that's dedicated to purple teaming now, right? I mean, there, there's events like those. So there's there's so many different presentations and so many different tools that you can use out there um, that you can really find one that fits your need, um, that some of them are easier to pick up and, and learn than others. But but at the same time, like there's just so much information out there that that fortunately I think that, that you've got the, the world is your oyster, so to speak. Yeah, I think just playing off of what Frank mentioned and to add a, a a little bit on start small like it's it's so easy to like and and this is speaking from experience to like really want to like dive into an entire threat report and something like that and to come up with this really cool emulation plan that's uh you know super high fidelity it's got all of the different uh you know different aspects of that threat baked in but at the end of the day I mean, if it takes me, you know, three months to push that out or in, and my response team is expecting the ability to test that in two weeks, right? You're going to have to figure out what is going to have that high impact. And so that's where I think starting small, starting with single procedures, moving up and, and sort of changing that, uh, that way, I think is really important when it comes to testing. So uh, I'll keep it succinct here because I know we're running out of time, but yeah, start small and work your way up. Yeah, no, that's, I mean, I, you know, you're, you're preaching to the choir for me. I, I think that, uh, I think that people start to get hung around the axle of like, oh, we're not mature enough to do this. Right. And, and you know, yeah, you may not be mature enough to do a full scope red team engagement or whatnot, but you certainly can, can do a little bit of research onto like, what are the, what, what kind of techniques could I execute and test in my environment and simulate um, whether or not we can detect them from our, from our blue team perspective. And I think that's, what's most important. I'll cut, kind of plays into this one question I think we'll have time for, and then I'll let you guys do some closing thoughts, but you know, is purple teaming meant to help, you know, the response capabilities, or is that the exact boundary where it falls into what red teaming exists for. My opinion is that yes, purple teaming is definitely geared towards helping you uh, identify where you can respond and whatnot, right? Um, uh, and that red teaming is definitely more of that perspective of you don't know what's going on. You know, can you detect this when you, you can you detect these activities when you don't have an, an idea of that it's happening versus purple teaming and you know it's going to be taking place. And so you you have that collaborative nature of like, oh, we're in real time, we can figure out where we might have missed the ball. Because once a red team is done, it's hard to go back and really see like, oh, here's where I saw they were doing those things. Even though people would love to be like say that they do that, I think that that's probably less common than, <laughs> but I'll, I'll stop there. Sorry. No, I, I agree wholeheartedly uh, with with that that comment and the fact that purple team should apply to all types of defenses that you do. Um, I think that adversary emulation it gets a little bit more interesting when you start dealing with like response testing, um, but even that is still possible. Uh, you just have to keep in mind, uh, okay, so what are the other types of techniques or procedures that the adversary has been known to deploy so that you can still keep it. A little bit grounded, but um, again, I mean, at, at the end of the day, um, as, as I think something that, that you brought up earlier, Dan, it's you need to have that plan. Like that, the, you need to be doing all these testings anyway. Um, so as long as you know the decisions you're making, the compromise to intel that you're doing, how far straying you are from emulation, at the end of the day, you just need to be purple teaming, right? And you need to be getting better and be able to base that on the threat and understand where you're deviating. 
All right. My, my quick thoughts on this is that absolutely testing process is, is part of this. So when, when we, and again, tying back to the purple team exercise framework, part of what we do when we go through these exercises and part of what it outlines is at the beginning, you essentially go through a tabletop for that specific step that you're going to do. So what's the expectation? And that includes going through an escalation process if that's going to happen in the SOC based on the TTP. Uh, somebody asked about you know what to look for after discovery. My question would be, what is your process after discovery? Is it you? Are you going to do some more hunts? Are you going to try and tie additional information? And all of that stuff should be recorded. And so that's that's where it comes down to. You can test the process extremely well while you are doing purple teaming. That's great. <clears throat> yeah, and I think I mean if there's one thing that I'll continue to hammer home, and I think everyone's here, uh, you know, uh, highlighted as well is like yeah, being disciplined in in how you how you structure this, having a plan. Um, and, and dedicating time to it. And I would say that if there's one roadblock that people tend to run into is like, where do I focus my time? Cause I've got so much going on and so many, so many blinky lights coming at me every day. Right. And so I think it is, it is kind of like that. Hey, um, if I want to lose weight, I got to go to the gym and I got to discipline myself to go do that. <laughs> I got to block time off my calendar. And I think, I think this is one of those, one of those activities, um, uh, so, you know, like, I think that that's, that's the way you need to approach this. Cause it is, in my opinion, one of the most vital things you could do. And, and, and one of the things that makes them a demonstrable impact in your security posture moving forward. So any last thoughts before we kind of sign off here? Um, can't thank you guys enough, but I'll let you say any, any last thoughts and then we'll, uh, we'll close it out. No, I appreciate the the chance to talk about this. Obviously, I've been been working in purple teaming and adversary emulation and and selling the wares of it uh, for for long enough now that that I really believe in it. I believe in, it, in its purpose and and the benefits that it can provide and that it gives you the starting point. So I appreciate the chance to talk about. It. If anybody has any questions for me, feel free to always reach out to to us over at uh, in ingenuity and happy to always talk about it or, or give thoughts on it. So, um, but thank you for, for giving this opportunity. Yeah. Thanks again, uh, Dan, for, for having us on here. One last thing, I'll, I'll give a shout out to uh, the C2 matrix as a, we, we've talked about adversary emulation. It's a bunch of the uh, sort of the community as well as there's some paid things on there as well, including Scythe, uh, but it has all of these frameworks and sort of a breakdown of the TTPs that they can emulate. Uh, and so I'd say, check it out. It's essentially a big Excel spreadsheet. So I, I know we had some questions about uh, resources and things like that. And so if you're curious, go check that out. Uh, thanks again, Frank, again, for, uh, for coming on and, you know, chatting with me as well. So thanks everyone. Yeah, no, thank you. Thanks Frank for, for, taking some time. Thanks, Tim, for your, for bringing, uh, bringing your expertise, both of you to, to the table. I think this is a great discussion and I'm sure maybe we'll, maybe we'll try to do some more. I think that this, there's, there's plenty to talk about here and, and, uh, you know, would love to continue this conversation down the road, but thanks so much for your time. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Um, uh, one last thing, if you want to set up a demo of PlexTrack, hit us up at plextrack.com slash demo. Um, also go check out Scythe. They have a great platform that we integrate with. And then the Ingenuity team is doing some fantastic things over at MITRE and uh, just really moving the needle forward, in my opinion, on the, on the, on the security front, helping us, helping us stay ahead as best as we can, which is, can be overwhelming at times. But thanks, everybody, for spending some time today. Good luck and happy hacking. So have a great day.